Section 2.5, Transformations. In this section, we look at moving, stretching, shrinking, and or reflecting a graph. So we're back to graphing. We will mainly apply this to graphs of functions, but can also be applied to graphs of relations. Of course, if you are given the formula for the function, the quickest or easiest way might still be to let your graphing calculator fun uh, graph the function. Um, it's also probably easier to actually make a table of values and draw it by hand than to go through all this nonsense we're about to go through. Now, some people are really big on the transformations and translations. I'm not that big on it. Translations. Definition. A translation of a graph is a movement of the graph without changing its shape or orientation. So a translation simply picks up a graph and moves it to a different location. The size of the graph does not change, nor does its shape. Only its location is different. That means if there were no coordinate axes or grid lines, it would not be possible to distinguish the original graph from the moved or translated graph. The moved graph is sometimes called the translated graph. Now, in general, we could say the transformed graph. A translation is a special type of transformation. Transformation can really alter how a graph looks. A translation doesn't. It just moves it. In dealing with translations, we have the following terminology. Number one, the original graph or function is called the parent graph or the parent function. Now, of course, you can also call it the original graph or the original function, but the technical name is parent graph or parent function. Number two, the moved graph or function is called the translated graph or the translated function. You can remember, translations are special types of transformations, so in general, number three, the translated graph or function may also be called the transformed graph or the transformed function. And again, remember, transformation means it somehow changes. A translation is a special type of transformation. The translation just moves it. Now, in order to figure out what something looks like after you move it, it's nice to know what did it look like before. So we need some basic parent functions or parent graphs to look at. Some of these we've actually seen before. So part A here, some basic graphs. We're going to have about a list of seven of them. So we will now look at some basic functions and their graphs. These basic graphs will act as parent graphs for many of our problems. Now, in drawing these, I actually did make a little table of values and I plotted some points. So it would be helpful for you to learn these basic graphs and functions. Some of them we have seen before. Again, it would also be nice if you learned their names. We're going to give you the technical names of each one of them as we go through them. And again, we're going to take a look at about seven of them. So here's the first one. The identity function, f of x equals x. You notice it's a line. It fits the conditions for a line. The slope is 1, the y-intercept is 0. Okay, it's called the identity function because no matter what you give it, it gives it back to you. So the identity function f of x, it looks like this. Okay, it's a line that goes through a 45 degree angle. It bisects the first and third quadrants. I got it by plotting the points negative 1, negative 1, 0, 0, and 1, 1. Remember, f of x is equal to x. Whatever you give the function, the function gives it back to you. Our second basic function, number two, the squaring function, f of x equals x squared. We have seen this before. We'll see it again in chapter three. So this is the basic parabola. The squaring function f of x equals x squared, it looks like this. Okay, again, we've seen it before. Okay, we've seen it before. I plotted the points 0, 0, negative 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 4, and negative 2, 4. We will actually study the squaring function in a little more detail in chapter 3. That's really all chapter 3 is about, squared functions. Our third basic function, number 3. The square root function, f of x equals the square root of x. Now remember, you cannot take the square root of negative numbers, so this is only valid for x greater than or equal to 0. So the graph will only go on forever in the positive direction. So the square root function, f of x equals square root of x, it looks like this. Okay, basically it's the top half of a parabola on its side. I plotted the points uh, 0, 0, 1, 1, and 4, 2. So it kind of, depending upon your point of view, it either begins or ends at the point 0, 0, at the origin, and it just keeps going to the right. 
So notice its domain is x greater than or equal to 0, and its range is y greater than or equal to 0. It is the top half of the parabola on its side. Okay, now see if we had a squaring function. For number 4, we have a cubing function. Cubing function, f of x equals x cubed. It looks like this. Okay, here are the points that I used. 0, 0, 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1, 2, 8, negative 2, 8. Uh, we may have seen this graph in connection with symmetry. After all, this graph is symmetric with respect to the origin, because if you notice, both coordinates change signs as I went from 1, 1 to negative 1, negative 1, and also when I went from 2, 8 to negative 2, negative 8. And also if you rotate through 180 degrees, it's the same graph. So anyway, there's the cubing function, the fourth of our basic graphs. If we have a cubing function, we also have for number 5, the cube root function. f of x equals the cube root of x. Now this one we probably saw before as well in connection with symmetry. So the cube root function, f of x equals x cubed, excuse me, cube root of x, it looks like this. Okay, and here are the points that I plotted. 0, 0, 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1, 8, 2, and negative 8, negative 2. Okay, so it does have symmetry with respect to the origin, because again, if you rotate it through 180 degrees, it's the same graph. Okay, so we may have seen that again in connection with symmetry. But anyway, that is the fifth of our basic graphs. Okay, number six, the reciprocal function, f of x equals one over x. Okay, I may have mentioned that in connection with the classic example of where you cannot give a function x equals zero, so you can't divide by zero. So since x equals zero is not in the domain, the graph of this function appears in two pieces. The piece to the left of the value x equals zero, which is the y-axis, so I have a piece to the left of the y-axis and a piece to the right of the y-axis. So the reciprocal function f of x equals one over x, it looks like this. Okay, now it really doesn't break apart. The software did that so you could read the numbers on the axis. So the points were 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1, 2, 0 0.5, negative 2, negative 0 0.5, 0.5 and 2, negative 0.5, negative 2. Remember, it's flipping the numbers over. Like if I take the reciprocal of 2, it's 1 half. If I take the reciprocal of 1 half, it's up here at 2. Okay? So the graph is in two pieces. The piece that's to the right of the y-axis, the piece that's to the left of the y-axis. Uh, notice, this function does have symmetry with respect to the origin. Okay, we actually had that as an example when we were doing symmetry, because if you rotate it through 180 degrees, the pieces will coincide. So there is the reciprocal function. The graph is in two pieces, even though the formula is not. So the graph is piecewise, but the function itself is not piecewise. So anyway, that's the sixth of our basic functions. It does not cross the x-axis. It does not cross the y-axis. The shape, by the way, is called a rectangular hyperbola. Here's the seventh and last of our basic functions. We have seen it before. Absolute value function. f of x equals absolute value of x. Remember, that was the one that graphed as a v. So f of x equals absolute value of x looks like this. It's a v. Okay, here were the points that I used. 0, 0, 1, 1. Negative 1, 1. 2, 2. Negative 2, 2. Okay, so it makes the V. And again, we have seen that one before. So those seven graphs will act as our parent graphs for a lot of our examples. So become familiar with their shapes, become familiar with their names. So we now get back to our translations now that we have our basic graphs out of the way. So there are two basic types of translations. So two basic types. Vertical translations. Okay, so this is a movement up or down. So a vertical translation moves a graph up or down. We just need to know how far does it move up, how far does it move down. Okay, I'm going to take a look at some basic examples here. I'm going to pick on the parabola. So we will look, we will graph the following three functions on the same set of axes. That way we can see the movement. So it's going to be f of x equals x squared, which will be drawn in black, and its table of values will be in black. g of x equals x squared plus 1, which is in red, and the graph will be in red as well the, as the points. 
and h of x is equal to x squared minus 3, which is in blue, so its graph will be in blue, and the y values will be in blue. So again, we're going to try to create the graphs all on one slide. So for my table of values, again, I'm going to have keep the x in black for all of them. Then f of x equals x squared, the y value is in uh, black, the g of x equals x squared plus 3, the y value is in red, and the h of x, x squared minus 3, the y value is in blue. I'm going to pick for my easy points, um, 0, 1, negative 1, 2, and negative 2. We may as well keep it easy. So starting off with x being 0. Okay, 0 squared is 0. 0 squared plus 3 gives me 3, and 0 squared minus 3 gives me negative 3. Okay. Then if I use 1, okay, 1 squared is 1. 1 squared plus 3 gives me 4. 1 squared minus 3 gives me negative 2. If x is negative 1. Okay, negative 1 squared is 1. Negative 1 squared plus 3 is 4. And negative 1 squared minus 3 is minus 2. I want you to notice something here. Remember, this is the basic one. This has a plus 3. This has a minus 3. If I add 3 to 0, I get that. If I subtract 3 from 0, I get the one in blue. Okay, and remember, this one was plus 3. If I add 3 to the y value here, I get the 4. If I subtract 3 from the y value, I get the negative 2. Hmm. Let's see, if x is 2, I have 2 squared is 4. 2 squared plus 3 is 7. And 2 squared minus 3 is 1. And then the other point I said I would plot would be x being negative 2. I get negative 2 squared is 4. Negative 2 squared plus 3 is 7. And negative 2 squared minus 3 is 1. And remember, g of x was x squared plus 3. And h of x was x squared minus 3. Now, let's take a look at their graphs now that we have these points. So we now present the three graphs. Again, I'm going to put them all on the same set of axes. Okay, here's the original one, the basic parabola. Here's x squared plus 3. <coughs> it seems to have moved up three units. Here's x squared minus 3. It seems to have moved down three units. Other than that, they all have the same basic shape. If it doesn't look like they have the basic shape, it's actually an optical illusion. They actually all do have the same basic shape. Remember, the one in black, that was the parent graph. The red one and the blue one, those are translated graphs. So recall, f of x equal to x squared, g of x is x squared plus 3, and h of x is x squared minus 3. Notice, hopefully you did notice, going back to them. And notice that the graph of g of x moves the graph of f of x up 3 units, and the graph of h of x moves the graph of f of x down 3 units. Again, there they are. So remember, it started here, the red graph got moved up, the blue graph got moved down. So this leads to the following. Again, notice, x squared plus 3, x squared minus 3. Vertical translations. Okay, vertical translations. Given the parent graph function f of x and a value b greater than 0, we have the following. Number one, the graph of y of x plus b is a vertical translation of the graph y of x up by b units. We say that the graph of y of x has been shifted up b units. Please be very careful when you write the word shifted. Number two, the graph of y of x minus b is a vertical translation of the graph of y of x down by b units. We say that the graph of y of x has been shifted down b units. Okay, now notice, the b, whether it be plus b or minus b, is not with the x. It's out by itself. If I wanted to, I could move it over with the y, and remember, y is the vertical axis. So if you have a number that's not associated with the x, it is not in parentheses with x, that's the vertical translation. If it's plus b, it's up. If it's minus b, down. Okay, so again, the b is not in parentheses with the x. It's kind of off by itself. So that's the vertical translation. Let's try some examples. So on the same set of axes, sketch the graphs of the following. Okay, now I, I know you can make a table of values and everything. So sometimes instead of actually graphing, it might ask you to describe the translation or transformation. So y equals the square root of x, that's our basic or parent graph. 
Notice the plus 2, it's not with the x, that's going up 2 units. For part c, y equals, uh, excuse me, square root of x minus 5, the minus 5 is not with the x, it's going down 5 units. So this is the same, one of the basic functions that we are supposed to know, so we can, we can make a table of values. So, 0, 0, because I'm, I'm doing the basic one for part a. 1, 1, and the square root of 1 is 1. I had to go to 4, I don't know the square root of 2 off the top of my head. So, square root of 4 is 2. And part b, this is a shift up of 2 units of the basic square root function. So if I wanted to, I could just add 2 to each one of those. Keep the x's the same. Remember, it's the y values, the functional values that are changing. The x values are the same. So I should have, if I use the same values, 0, 1, 4, these become, again, add 2. 2, 3, 4. So 0, 0 went to 0, 0 plus 2, which is 0, 2. 1, 1 goes to 1, comma, 1 plus 2, which is 1, 3. 4, 2 goes to 4, 2 plus 2, which is 4, 4. So this is how I can keep track of my points. And <clears throat> part C, we'll do the same thing, except we'll be subtracting 5 from each of the y values. Remember, the x values don't stay the same. So the x values stay the same. It's the y values that get the plus or the minus, because it's the functional values that are moving the graph up or down. So for part C, oh, for part B, we're going to show the graph in red. And for part C, this is shift down of 5 units of the basic square root function. So again, subtract 5 from those values. So let's go to the next slide and do that. So we're going to subtract 5 from each y value. Again, we know it's a vertical translation because the number out here is not with the x. It's not under the square root function with the x. So subtracting 5. 0, 0 goes to 0, 0 minus 5, which is 0 minus 5. 1, 1 goes to 1, comma 1 minus 5, which is 1, negative 4. 4, 2 goes to 4, comma 2 minus 5, which is 4, negative 3. So these points right here are what I will use to graph part C. And uh, I'll do those in blue. Okay, so now hopefully you've kept track of the points for each of the three graphs. So let's graph them. Here's the parent graph, square root of x. Okay, by the way, remember SQRT means square root. Remember in D2L, that's what you have to type if you want the square root of x, SQRT, and it's pronounced squirt. Okay, and up here is the red graph, got shifted up two units, so shift it up. And the blue graph got shifted down five units from the parent graph. So there are three graphs. Remember, they all kind of end or begin, depending upon your point of view, at x equals zero, which is the y-axis. And they keep going forever to the right. Let's take a look at another one. Number two. Below is the graph of y equal f of x. Notice it does not go on forever. Sketch the graph of y equal f of x minus 4. Okay, this is to prevent you from saying, I'll just take out my graph and calculator and just let it draw it. Okay, so we're going to figure out how does this move. Okay, notice the minus 4 is not with the x. It's outside parentheses from the x. So this is a translation down 4 units. I'm going to keep track of these four points. Okay, I'll keep track of those four points and then draw the graph by connecting the new four points. So I began here at negative 3, negative 1. It went up to 0, 2, then came down to 1, 0, and then it goes up to 3, 3. So this is the parent graph. Okay, I'll give you a moment to draw that. Okay, so our solution, remember, the shift is down 4 units because I see the minus 4 and it's not with the x. It is not in parentheses with the x. It's not under the, a square root. It's not instead of an absolute value with x. So shift down 4 units. We subtract 4 from the important points. Okay, the important points are these dots. Okay. Okay, hopefully you've got them labeled. Negative 3, negative 1, 0, 2, 1, 0, 3, 3. 
Now remember, we're subtracting 4 from the y values because the vertical translation does the y values. So negative 3, negative 1. We'll go to negative 3, negative 1 minus 4, which is negative 3, 5. 0, 2 goes to 0, 2 minus 4, which is 0 minus 2. 1, 0 goes to 1, 0 minus 4, which is the point 1, negative 4. And 3, 3 goes to 3, 3 minus 4, which is 3, negative 1. So these points here, where I ended up, those will be what I use. Those will be the ones that I plot in order to draw the graph of y equal f of x minus 4. Because notice there is no formula for the function, so I really can't give a function to my calculator and let my calculator draw it. So I need to plot those four points and then connect them. So there's the graph of y equal f of x minus 4. Here are my four important points for it. And I remember, the vertical translation, the number is not inside of parentheses with the x, it's not inside a square root, it's not inside an absolute value with the x, that's how you know it's vertical, it's kind of off by itself, that's the up or down. We're now going to take a look at the other important translation, horizontal translations. Okay, this is the left or right. So a horizontal translation moves a graph left or right. Remember, the horizontal axis is the x-axis, so that means somehow the value is inside of parentheses or square roots or absolute values with the x. So an example. Again, I'm going to pick on the parabola. So we'll draw, graph the following three functions on the same set of axes. Again, I'm picking on the parabola. f of x equals x squared, the basic parabola. g of x is x plus 2 squared, and h of x is x minus 2 squared. Okay, notice the 2 and the minus 2, they're in parentheses with the x. That's how I know it belongs with the x. It's in parentheses with it. That's how I know it's going to be a horizontal. So I'm going to make my table of values. So for x to be 0, I got 0 squared. 0 plus 2 squared is 4. 0 minus 2 squared is also 4. Then the next easy value is 1. Okay, 1 squared is 1. 1 plus 2 squared is 9. This kind of worries me. I'm getting a big value. 1 minus 2 squared, okay, 1 minus 2 is negative 1, but if you square negative 1, you get 1. Negative 1 for x, negative 1 being squared is 1. Negative 1 plus 2 is 1, and 1 squared is 1. Negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3, and if you square negative 3, you get 9. Hmm, there's that big value again. Then I tried 2. 2 squared is 4. 2 plus 2 is 4, and 4 squared is 16. That's probably not going to be on my graph when I draw it. 2 minus 2 is 0, 0 squared is 0. Then I, of course, did the negative 2's. Uh, negative 2 being squared is 4. Negative 2 plus 2 is 0, and 0 squared is 0. Negative 2 minus 2 is negative 4, and negative 4 squared is 16. Okay, this, these big values probably won't make it on my graph. But anyway, I think I have enough points to start to see the shape of a parabola. Remember, all of these are parabolas. The one in black will be the basic parabola. The one in the red will have the x plus 2 being squared. The one in blue will have the x minus 2 being squared. So notice I have a plus 2 with the x and a minus 2 with the x. And again, I know it's with x because it's inside parentheses with x. Okay, let's I'll draw the graphs. We're going to show the graphs on the next slide. Okay, it's going to be on all on the same set of axes so that we can see what's happening. So again, remember, the red one is supposed to be x plus 2. The blue one is x minus 2. Probably the easiest thing to keep track of is going to be what happens with the origin. Because remember, the black graph is going to go through 0, 0. So there they are. And remember, the red one was x plus 2, but the origin seems to have moved to the left. The blue one was x minus 2, but yet the origin appears to have moved to the right. Hmm. So, again, here are our functions. Recall, f of x was x squared, g of x was x plus 2 squared, h of x was x minus 2 squared. So we see the graph of y equals f of x, which is the graph of y equals g of x, shifts the graph of y equals f of x 
to the last two units. So let's go back. The red graph is in fact the black graph two units to the right. The blue graph, notice, is excuse me, two units to the right. That's my other right. It's two units to the left. Okay. The blue graph is the black graph two units to the right. So the red went left, the blue went right. So in the graph y of h of x shifts the graph y of x to the right two units. Even though it says x minus 2, it went right. This one, even though it says x plus 2, I went to the left. Notice we're doing the opposite of what it says. So the fact that I'm going to the opposite, you know, x plus 2 versus x minus 2, it leads to this little fact. Horizontal translations. Given the graph of y equal f of x and d greater than 0, we have the following. For number 1, the graph of y equal f of x minus d, notice it's x minus d, not x plus, is a horizontal translation of the graph of y equal f of x shifted right by d units. We see that the graph of y equal f of x has been shifted right d units. Okay, now why is it the opposite? Okay, why, why, why am I not going to the left even though it says x minus d? What's really going on is you're trying to figure out what will make x minus d equal to zero. That's really what's going on. You're trying to figure out what, what makes x minus d equal zero. And notice it's a positive d. For number two, the graph of y equal f of x plus d is a horizontal translation of the graph of y equal f of x left by d units. So we see that the graph of y equal f of x has been shifted left d units. Now again, why is it left? It comes down to, again, what makes x plus d equal to 0? It's negative d. And negative d says go to the left. Okay, so basically, with the horizontal translation, you're doing the opposite of what you're looking at. If you see a plus a number, you're going to the left. If you see minus a number, you're going to the right. So the horizontal translations are the opposite. And again, you know it's horizontal because you will actually see a number inside of parentheses with x or under a square root or under a cube root or inside of absolute values with the x. That's how you know it's horizontal. Remember, the vertical ones, they're not with the x. They're kind of off by themselves. Now, of course, we can combine the horizontal and vertical translations. Just like when we plot a point, we're actually combining a left, right, and an up or down. So combining vertical and horizontal shifts. Vertical and horizontal shifts can be combined in one problem, and oftentimes they are. Just like when you plot points, they're not always on an axis, they're usually somewhere out in a quadrant. So to distinguish the vertical shifts from the horizontal shifts, keep the following points in mind. Number one, the value for the horizontal shift is always in parentheses or implied parentheses with x. Remember, the implied parentheses are like the absolute values or the radicals. Number two, the value for the vertical shift is always off by itself. Say it can be moved to join the y or the f of x. That's how you know it's vertical. Number three, for horizontal shift, if you see x plus d, you will go to the left. And if you see x minus d, you will go to the right. Remember, it's kind of the opposite because it comes down to what will make the expression x plus d or x minus d, what makes it zero. So for the horizontal shift, these are the opposite of what you're looking at. For vertical shift, if you see plus b, you will go up b units, and if you see minus b, you will go down b units. So the vertical, you do exactly what you see. For the horizontal, you do the opposite of what you see. Let's try some examples. So some examples. Describe, so you're not going to draw it, describe how the graph of the fun given function can be obtained from one of our seven basic functions by a translation. So you're going to tell me what the basic function is, and you're going to tell me translate up or down, translate left or right, and how far. So you're just going to describe it. Okay, number one, I've got f of x, the square root of x plus 5, and then plus 8. Okay, hopefully you can see that the plus 8 is off by itself, and the plus 5 is with the x. So our solution, we have 5 with x and 8 off by itself. So the 5 is horizontal, the 8 is vertical. <coughs> Excuse me. Our parent function is, of course, the square root of x function. So if I had to describe it, translation of y equal to square root of x, left 5 units and up 8. Remember for x, opposite of what you see. For the y, exactly what you see. So horizontal, opposite of what you see. Vertical, exactly what you see. And that's, that's your description. Okay, the parent function, how far left or right, how far up or down. Number two, 
I've got f of x equal to the absolute value of x minus 6 plus 3. Okay, the x minus 6 is inside, excuse me, the, minus, the x minus 6 is not the absolute value, the minus 6 is with x. So minus 6 is with x because the absolute value, and the 3 is off by itself. Okay, the apparent function is, of course, the absolute value function. Okay, remember for the horizontal, opposite of what you see. So I'm going right 6 units, and for the vertical, exactly what you see. So I'm going up 3 units. So it's a translation of y equals absolute value of x, right 6 units, and up 3 units. For number 3, f of x equals 1 over x minus 2, then minus 11. Okay, now if you were to give this to your graphing calculator to graph, because of the operation of the denominator, you would need parentheses around x minus 2. So the minus 2 is with the x. The minus 11 is off by itself. The parent function, hopefully you can see, it is 1 over x. That is the parent function. So negative 2 is with x, and negative 11 is off by itself. So again, with the horizontal, opposite of what you see. So I'm going right 2 units, and then down 11. So it's a translation of y equals 1 over x, right 2 units, and down 11 units. This next group of examples, we're just going to kind of, kind of keep track of a point under a translation. Because if you're going to graph it, that's what you have to be able to do, keep track of some points. So, for the given point that is on the graph of y equals f of x, determine the coordinates of the corresponding point on the translated graph. Simplify your answers, use correct notation in your answers. Uh, the correct notation amounts to these are points, don't forget to put them in parentheses. So we're just going to translate a point, because if you can't translate a point, it's usually true you can't translate the whole graph, but sometimes students can translate a whole graph, but for some reason they cannot translate a single point. So here's our first one. My point is negative 6, 12, and the translation is y equals f of x minus 6 minus 14. Okay, the minus 6 is with x, the minus 14 is off by itself. Remember, for the x, do the opposite. For the vertical, do exactly what you see. So I'm going to add 6 to x, subtract 14 from y. So right 6 and down 14. Okay, right 6, down 14. So add 6 to x and subtract 14 from y. Okay, be careful with the arithmetic. So negative 6, 12 goes to negative 6 plus 6, which is 12, and then to 12 minus 14, and now do the math. 0, negative 2. There's your final answer. The translated point is 0, negative 2. Number 2. The point is negative 8, negative 15. And the translation is y equals f of x plus 3 minus 12. Okay, the 3 is with the x, the minus 12 is with the y. So remember for the x, opposite of what you see, for the y, exactly what you see. So I'm going left 3, down 2. Okay, left 3, down 2, oh, down 12. That means subtract 3 from x and subtract 12 from y. Okay, left 3, down 12. So I'm going to have negative 8, negative 15. We'll go to negative 8 minus 3, negative 15 minus 12. And doing the math, I get negative 11, negative 27. That's your final answer. Let's try another one. The point is 5, negative 9. And the translation is y equals f of x plus 3, plus 24. Okay, that plus 3 is with x. The 24 is with the y. So I'm going to go, remember for x, do the opposite, for the y, do exactly what you see. So I'm going to go left 3, up 24. Okay, left 3, up 24. So that means I'll subtract 3 from x, add 24 to y. So 5 negative 9 goes to 5 minus 3, negative 9 plus 24, which gives me 2, 15. Okay, 2, 15 is your final answer. Don't forget the parentheses, it is a point. Let's try a little bit of graphing. So, some examples. Given the graph of y equals fx, so again, no formula is going to be given, graph the given translation on the same set of axes. So we're going to keep track of points. So this is like the previous three examples, but applied to a graph. 
So below is the graph of y equal f of x. I'm going to graph y equal f of x minus 2 plus 3. So here are the points I keep track of. Negative 3, 0, negative 1, 3, and 1, negative 1. Okay, notice, don't connect these two to make a triangle. It wouldn't be a function. Okay, remember, half the path, vertical line test. So I'm going to figure out what happens to those three points, then connect them in the same order. Okay, so looking at my translation, I've got x minus 2 and then plus 3. So I go right 2 and up 3, again going back to this. Remember, opposite of what you see, exactly what you see. So right 2, up 3. And again, I'm keeping track of negative 3, 0, negative 1, 3, and 1, negative 1. So right 2, up 3. So I'm going to add 2 to x and add 3 to y. So negative 3, 0 goes to negative 3 plus 2, 0 plus 3 which is negative 1, 3. Negative 1, 3 goes to negative 1 plus 2, 3 plus 3, which is 1, 6. And 1, negative 1 goes to 1 plus 2, negative 1 plus 3, which is 3, 2. Remember, these points right here were already labeled on the graph. Negative 3, 0, negative 1, 3, and 1, negative 1. They were labeled, or they were the heavy dots, on my original given function. These are my translated points. Negative 1, 3, 1, 6, 3, 2. I will plot those and then connect them in the same order. So here they are. So does the red graph look like it's the black graph that went right 2 and up 3? Kind of a strange coincidence. I had one point that was actually on both graphs. So the red graph is our answer. Remember, the black graph was the statement of the problem. Kind of at a minimum, if I give you or draw you a graph of a function, the minimum number of points that you're going to have to worry about is two, that the original graph is just a line segment. I like to use the three, though. Okay, number two. Below is the graph of y equal f of x. We're going to graph y equal f of x plus one, plus two. So my important point, negative two, negative one. One, three. Three, negative two. So I will keep track of negative two, negative one. 1, 3, and 3, negative 2. And when I translate it, I will connect them in the same order. Again, don't make a triangle. It wouldn't be a function. So if I look at my translation, f of x plus 1 plus 2. This is with x, this is with y. So I'm going left 1, up 2. Remember, the x opposite of what you see. It comes down to what makes x plus 1, 0, negative 1. So that's left 1, up 2. So left 1, up 2. So again, our points, negative 2, negative 1, 1, 3, 3, negative 2. So subtract 1 from x, add 2 to y. So negative 2, negative 1 goes to negative 2 minus 1, negative 1 plus 2, which is negative 3, 1. 1, 3, okay, 1 minus 1, 3 plus 2, I get 0, 5. 3, negative 2 goes to 3 minus 1, negative 2 plus 2, which is 2, 0. These are the points that I will connect to make my translated graph. Negative 3, 1, 0, 5, and 2, 0. And we'll show that in red. So again, does the red graph look like the black graph that went left 1 and up 2? Notice the, the shape of each graph is the same. If you cannot get the shapes to be the same, then you've got at least one of the points out of place. Remember, all we're doing is moving the graph. We're just doing a translation. Later on in this section, we'll actually be changing the shape a little bit. Okay, if we move on to our next topic, reflections. Okay, reflections. Reflections sometimes mean flip it over or flip it through an axis. So definition, a reflection of a graph through a line is a mirror image of the graph through the line. The reflection of the graph through a line is found by folding along the line and looking at the new image. This is actually kind of an art skill if you're doing it by hand. Of course, we're going to try to keep track of points. We have two basic reflections, because again, we have two basic lines, the x-axis and y-axis. So reflection through the y-axis. 
Okay, so you're gonna look at the mirror image through the y-axis. So the reflection of y equals f of x through the x-axis is y equals the f of negative x. Notice the minus sign is going on the other variable. We're going through the y-axis, so put the minus on the x. So this means that all of the x values get multiplied by negative 1. Right? That's what that minus in front of the x means. Multiply all the x values by negative 1. That's how you will plot the reflection. Before doing examples, we're going to look at the other common reflection. That way we can kind of combine them. So remember, the other good line is the x-axis. So for part B, reflection through the x-axis. Remember, the minus sign should be on the other variable. So the reflection of y equals f of x through the x-axis is y equals the negative of f of x. So this is multiplying all the y values, all the functional values, by negative 1. So this means that all of the y values get multiplied by negative 1. So to reflect through the x-axis, multiply the y by negative 1. To reflect through the y-axis, multiply the x's by negative 1. It's the other variable that gets multiplied by negative 1 for a reflection. Some examples. Okay, below is the graph of y equal f of x. I think we may have seen it before. We're going to sketch the graph of y equal f of negative x. So again, i got these points, negative 3, 0, negative 1, 3, and 2, negative 1. So remember, the minus sign is right here inside the x. Multiply each of the x's by negative 1. So I'll give you a moment to draw that. Negative 3, 0, negative 1, 3, 2, negative 1. Okay, so multiply all x values by negative 1. Again, because I have that minus sign sitting in front of the x in my transformation. Okay, this technically is a special type of transformation. A reflection is a special type of transformation. It's also a special type of stretching and shrinking. So multiply all x values by negative 1. Okay, remember, we're keeping track of negative 3, 0, negative 1, 3, and 2, negative 1. So negative 3, 0 becomes 3, 0. Remember, multiply the x's by negative 1. Negative 1, 3 becomes 1, 3. And 2, negative 1 becomes negative 2, negative 1. Remember, I'm trying to reflect through the y-axis. So these are the points that I'm going to plot for my reflection. 3, 0, 1, 3, negative 2, negative 1. So I multiplied the x values by negative 1. And that's what we get. So does it look like the red graph is the reflection of the black graph through the y-axis? Kind of have you rotated it through the y-axis? So there's my negative 2, negative 1, my 1, 3, my 3, 0. The red dots should be the corresponding black dots for the x values multiplied by negative 1. Okay, for number 2, it's the same graph. Lows the graph of y equals f of x. This time we're going to sketch the graph of y equal the negative of f of x. So again, I've got negative 3, 0, negative 1, 3, and 2, negative 1. It's the same graph, the same function that we had for number 1. Okay, this time the minus sign is in front of the function. It's not with the x. So all of the y values get multiplied by negative 1. This is a reflection through the x-axis. So it should be like I flip this guy down. So I'm kind of rotating it through the x-axis. So again, the minus sign is in front of the function. Multiply the y values by negative 1. So I'm looking at negative 3, 0, negative 1, 3, and 2, negative 1. So multiply all y values by negative 1. So I'll have negative 3, 0 goes to negative 3, 0, because, you know, 0 times negative 1 is still 0. Okay, negative 1, 3 goes to negative 1, negative 3. 2, negative 1 goes to 2, 1. Again, multiply all the y values by negative 1. So these points, negative 3, 0, negative 1, negative 3, and 2, 1, I use those to draw the reflection. And there it is. So the red graph should look like the black graph rotated through the x-axis. Notice anything that's on the x-axis stays on the x-axis. So the red graph is the reflection through the x-axis of the black graph. <coughs> Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
let's go on to the ultimate with the transformations stretching and shrinking <coughs> Now, just like with everything else that was going on before, there's two versions, one for X, one for Y, kind of a vertical and a horizontal. Okay, the horizontal is the X, the vertical is the Y. So stretching and shrinking. So if there are two types of stretching and shrinking. It says the name implies the graphs are literally stretched or shrunk. The basic shape will be there, but it may look distorted. Okay, the vertical stretching and shrinking is actually a little bit easier to, to visualize. A horizontal stretching and shrinking sometimes looks like it's the vertical opposite. So. Um, the book kind of dwells on it a little bit, but it turns out vertical is more common than horizontal. It becomes a little more important in the trig class, then. so that's 11.12, or if you do the ultimate, uh, the 11.13. So the vertical stretching and shrinking. <clears throat> now again, this is the one that's a little bit easier to see. So in order to stretch or shrink a graph in the vertical direction, the hills and valleys of the grass must move further away from each other in the y direction, or stretch, or they must move closer for the shrinking to each other in the y direction for a shrink. Okay. So it's kind of like the hills and valleys move closer together or further apart. It, for the vertical stretching and shrinking, is it, easy, it is easy to tell a stretch from a shrink. It really is. Now, a translation is not considered a vertical stretch or shrink, but the reflection is a special type of stretching and shrinking. The book, for some reason, separates it. So this amounts to multiplying the y values by a non-zero number. So to stretch or shrink, you multiply the y values by a non-zero number. Now, if your number is also negative, <coughs> you also have a reflection through the x-axis. Um, in order to multiply the y values by a non-zero number in terms of functions, the number is in front of the function f. So this leads to, can I remember, I need a number in front of f of x. Vertical stretching and shrinking. So given the graph of y equal f of x and a not equal to zero, the graph of y equal a times f of x is obtained from the graph of y equal f of x by you're going to do this thing. It's kind of like how it looks. Multiply the y values by a. It's a vertical stretching by a factor of a if the absolute value of a is greater than 1. Again, that's what you would say. It's a vertical stretching by a factor of 3 or a factor of 4. Now, if a is also negative, you've got a reflection. It's a vertical shrinking by a factor of a if 0 is less than the absolute value is less than 1. So if you got like 1 half, then you say you shrunk by a factor of 1 half. Or if it's 2 thirds, you know, you shrunk by a factor of 2 thirds. Now again, if a is negative, you also have a reflection through the x-axis. So additionally, if a is negative, then the graph is also reflected through the x-axis. Uh, my math lab likes to separate them. So you first take care of the stretch or shrink, and then you worry about did it reflect. So literally, multiply the y values by a to plot the points, though. Just multiply the y values by a. Whatever a is, multiply the y values by a. So we multiply all y values by a. That's all you do. Even if a is negative, if you're going to plot the points, even if a is negative, whatever the value of a is, multiply the y values by that, and that will let you plot the points. Horizontal stretching and shrinking. Okay, if you think back to the translations, we did the opposite of what you saw. Well, in order to stretch or shrink a graph in the horizontal direction, the hills and valleys of the graphs must move further away from each other in the x direction for a stretch, or they must move closer to each other in the x direction for a shrink. Now again, sometimes a vertical stretch actually looks like a horizontal shrink, and vice versa. So this amounts to multiplying the x values by a non-zero number. Okay, so to do a horizontal stretch or shrink, you multiply the x values by a non-zero number. Technically, it's supposed to be divide. So keep in mind that in the x direction, everything was opposite. For translation, seeing plus a number meant move left, and seeing minus a number meant move right. The same thing will happen here. This leads to, now again, you're going to do the opposite. So it's really not multiplying, you're really dividing. Horizontal stretching and shrinking. Given the graph of y equal f of x, and uh, number c not equal 0, the graph of y equal f of cx, and notice the c is in parentheses with the x, so that means it would be under the radical with the x, or it would be inside the absolute values with the x, is obtained from the graph of y equal fx by the following. Okay, number one, the horizontal stretching by a factor of c, if 0 is less than c, is le the absolute value c is less than 1. So notice, if you have a fraction multiplying the x, you have a stretch. So if you see 1 half x, you've stretched it. Okay? Number two, a horizontal shrinking by a factor of c if that value of c is greater than one. And of course, if you have a minus for the c, you also have reflected through the y-axis. So 
So if C is negative, then the ramp is also reflected through the y-axis. Now remember, for the vertical, you multiplied all the y values by the number that was in front of the function. For the horizontal, you will divide. So we divide all x values by c. Okay, it's not the opposite of what you see. It's consistent with the translation. For the horizontal direction, do the opposite of what you see. So you're going to divide by the number c. Because notice, I'm looking at c times x, so divide the x's by c. Let's try some examples. Below is the graph of y equal f of x. On the same set of axes, we're going to sketch the graph of y equal 2 times f of x. So I'm going to keep track of negative 1, negative 1, 1, 2, and 3, negative 2. I need a moment to draw those. Notice the number 2 is in front of the function. I'm going to multiply all the y values by 2. If we were to describe it, this is a vertical stretch by a factor of 2. Okay, that's what you would say, a vertical stretch by a factor of 2. So the points, negative 1, negative 1, 1, 2, 3, negative 2. Again, we have a vertical stretching by a factor of 2. And again, those points multiply all y coordinates by 2. Remember, for the vertical direction, for the y direction, do exactly what you see. So negative 1, negative 1 goes to negative 1, negative 2. 1, 2 goes to 1, 4. 3, negative 2 goes to 3, negative 4. Remember, multiply all the y coordinates by 2. And then we keep track of these three points. We plot those three points and then draw the graph. There it is. The red graph is supposed to look like the black graph stretched in a vertical direction. So it's kind of like you grab the points and began pulling them away from each other. If you uh, look at it a little more closely, it also looks like someone pushed it together from the left and right direction. So that would make it look like a horizontal shrinking. But technically, because the 2 is in front of the f of x, it's a vertical stretch by a factor of 2. Number 2. Below is the graph of y with f of x. It's the same one that we had before. On the same set of axes, we're going to sketch the graph of y equal f of 2x. So again, I've got the points negative 1, negative 1, 1, 2, and 3, negative 2. Okay, in this one, the 2 multiplies the x. This is a horizontal stretching or shrinking. Now remember with the x, do the opposite. So this is a shrinking by a factor of 2. So it's a horizontal shrink by a factor of 2. That's what we would say, horizontal shrinking by a factor of 2. Now again, it's with the x. You see multiplication by 2, remember, you're going to divide. So divide all x coordinates by 2. Okay, you're going to divide all the x coordinates by 2. Notice with the division, you might be forced to plot a fractional value. So negative 1, negative 1 becomes negative 1 half, negative 1. 1, 2 becomes 1 half, 2. And 3, negative 2 becomes 3 halves, negative 2. So we divided all the x coordinates by 2. Now when you plot a fractional value, just do the best. You know, it's halfway between. So these three points are what I'm going to use to draw the shrunk graph. Remember, it's shrunk by a factor of 2 in the horizontal direction. So there it is. Does the red graph look like somebody took the black graph and squeezed it in from the left and right? It's kind of like your hands were on the left and right side and just began pushing toward each other. Now again, between vertical and horizontal stretching and shrinking, the vertical is more common. Now again, it's actually more important in trig, and that's when they like to do everything to you in terms of transformation. So remember this section should you go to 11.12 or 11.13. Okay, before doing any more examples, we look at transformations in all their glory. So that's the left, right, up, down, the reflection, the stretching and shrinking. So we're going to combine vertical and horizontal translations, reflections, and vertical and horizontal stretching shrinking in any combination, all in one problem. 
you have to figure out what gets done first. It does make a difference. So we need to determine the order of the transformations. It follows the order of operations. You know, the My Dear Aunt Sally thing, which kind of means start from inside your parentheses and work your way out. Okay, now there are some slight modifications. So remember this order. It will alter your graph. Because now that we have the stretching and shrinkings, the shape of the graph really can change. And with the reflections, the orientation of the graph can also change. So the order of the transformations. We will be given y equals f of x and asked to find y equals a times f of cx plus d plus b, where a, b, c, and d are numbers. And by the way, this is the order that the letters are supposed to be, not the way we've been doing them before. So the a, c, x plus d, okay? Notice the c and the d are with the x, the a and the d are with the y. So you're starting with f of x and looking at a times f of cx plus d, then plus b. So we do the transformations in the following order. Remember, translations are a special type of transformation, so I'm lumping them all with this. Reflections are also a special type of transformation. Number one, perform any horizontal translations. Move left or right D units. For plus D, go left. For minus D, go right. Okay, so you first take care of this guy. Because if you were solving CX plus D equals zero, you would first say move the D to the other side. So it kind of follows your solving equation. This again is why the X stuff is in the opposite of what you're looking at. You're actually setting this thing in parentheses, CX plus D equals zero. So you first move your left to right. Then, perform any horizontal stretching or shrinking. Divide all X values by C. Because again, if you were doing CX plus D equals zero, you'd first move the D to the other side and then divide by C. So take care of all the horizontal stuff first. So you know that's the stuff that's inside parentheses. So you move your graph left to right, and then you stretch or shrink vertically. Okay, so now we're coming outside the parentheses. Perform any vertical stretching or shrinking. Multiply all y values by a. Because again, according to my dear Aunt Sally, you actually would multiply. And then after you've done all your vertical stretching and shrinking, there's only one thing left to do move up or down. So that's your vertical translation. So perform any vertical translations. Move up or down, B units. For plus B, go up. And for minus B, go down. So remember, it's left, right, then divide X's by C, multiply Y's by A, and then go up or down in that order. Also, when you describe it, that's also how you should describe it. Note, any reflections will be taken care of by the stretching or shrinking. So the plus or minus on the C and the A, that's done when you do your division by C or your multiplication by A. So your reflection through the Y axis is taken care of here when you divide all X values by C. Your reflection through the X axis is done here in step three when you multiply all the Y values by A. Let's try a couple of examples. Below is the graph of y equal f of x. Sketch the graph of y equal 2 times f of x minus 3 plus 1 on the same set of axes. So we're going to keep track of negative 1, negative 1, 1, 2, and 3, negative 1. Okay, contained inside of how we're going to graph this is a little sub-problem of if I give you just one point and ask you to find the transformed point. So again, we're going to keep track of negative 1, negative 1, 1, 2, and 3, negative 2. I've got y equals 2 times f of x minus 3 plus 1. Okay, so we ready? Remember, first, take care of numbers that add or subtract the x. Remember, you're setting x minus 3 equal to 0. So I'm going to go right 3. So step 1, we're going to shift right 3 units. So we're going to add 3 to all the x values. So negative 1, negative 1 becomes 2, negative 1. 1, 2 becomes 4, 2. And 3, negative 2 becomes 6, negative 2. We added 3 to all the x values. 
Okay, now if there were a step two, I would divide all the x values by the number that was in front of the x. Remember, I had x minus three. So step two is gonna be the vertical stretch because there was no horizontal stretching or shrinking. The number in front of the x was one. So vertical stretch by a factor of two, right? Two times the function. So multiply all y values by two. Now, you pick up with where we left off here. You're now working with these points. Two, negative one, four, two, six, negative two. Those y values get multiplied by two. So two, negative one becomes two, negative two. Four, two becomes four, four. Six, negative two becomes six, negative four. So picking up where you left off, I now have these points to worry about. Two, negative two, four, four, and six, negative four. Okay, I'm now getting ready to take care of the translation up or down. So I shift up one unit because of that plus one that was on the end. So I'm gonna add one to each y value of where these points left off. So two, negative two becomes two, negative one. So I'm adding one to all y values. Four, four becomes four, five and six negative four becomes six negative three. And these are the points that I will plot in order to graph the transformed graph. There it is. Notice the graph looks slightly different because of the transformation, the stretching and shrinking Okay, let's try one more. Okay, it's the same function that I had before. The negative one, negative one, one, two, three, negative two. This time we're gonna graph y equal negative three times f of x, excuse me, f of two x plus one minus two. Notice I've got everything for this one. I've got something in front of the function, something in front of the x, something added to or subtracted from x, and then a number off by itself. Okay, so I've got everything on this one. So y equals negative three times f of x f of 2x plus 1 minus 2. If you were to describe it, it's a horizontal shift left one unit, a shrinking by a factor, a horizontal shrinking by a factor of 2, a vertical stretch by a factor of 3, a reflection through the x-axis, and then a vertical shift down one unit. So remember, you start with the 2x plus 1, and you're thinking about making 2x plus 1 equal to 0. So these points, negative one, negative one, one, two, three, negative two, I keep track of them. So again, thinking of making two x plus one equal to zero. The first thing you're gonna do, step one, you're gonna shift left one unit. So you're gonna subtract one. Again, thinking of making two x plus one equal to zero, subtract one from each x value. So negative one, negative one becomes negative two, negative one. One, two becomes zero, two. Three, negative two becomes two, negative two. I've taken care of the one in two x plus one. Again, you're thinking of making 2x plus 1 equal to 0. Okay, you subtracted 1. Now divide by 2. Remember, for the number in front of the x, divide all the x values by it. So a horizontal shrink by a factor of 2. Divide each x value by 2. So we start now with these points. So divide all of those x values by 2. So negative 2, 1 becomes negative 1, 1. 0, 2 remains 0, 2. 2 negative 2 becomes 1 negative 2. I'm done with the x's. Okay, our next two things, we're going to take care of the y's. So as you work your way out from the function, remember we had a negative 3 in front of the function. So that's a reflection through the x-axis, and it's a vertical stretch by a factor of 3. So step 3, vertical reflection and stretch by a factor of negative 3. Multiply all the y values by negative 3. Now again, pick up with where we left off here. So negative one, negative one, zero, two, one, negative two, multiply the y values by negative three. So I get the points negative one, three, zero, negative six, and one, six, right? And we only have one more step to go. We have to take care of the minus two that was on the end. Remember we had y equals negative three times f of, that, f of two x plus one minus two. So now I have a vertical translation down Two. So I'm going to subtract 2 from all the y values. So I'm going to subtract 2 from these y values. So I'll end up with negative 1, 1, 0, negative 8, 
and 1, 4. These three points will be what I use to graph my transformed graph. And there it is. Notice in terms of shape and everything, it looks drastically altered from the original function. Okay, when you put together all the translations, that can happen. Again, the graph really didn't break apart. The software is doing that so you can read the uh, number scales on the axes. So the red graph is our final answer. Okay, again, translations, transformations is done more intrigued than in algebra. So you'll see it in 11.12, you'll see it in 11.13. That's the end of section 2.5.